Hari Bo Namaste Krishna. Welcome to my uh, Bhagavad Gita class and Kirtan. And I'm just going to get it up on my uh, other phone so I can make sure it's working. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so once again, uh, Radhi Shamdasi is not here, and so it's me. And, uh, so we'll just have a short cut. Hey, Paul.
Jaya Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Parivajika Siddhar Sarashishimad Gaku Siddhasuru Pananda Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Paramahansa Parivajika Siddhar Sarashishimad His Divine Grace Shri A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai Ananta Kuru Vaishnavrini Ki Jai Prem Sikaho, Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nichananda, Shri Advaita Garadar, Shri Asadigo Bhaktivrini Ki Jai, Namacharya Shri Haridas Sako Ki Jai, Itai Goswald Mission Ki Jai, Nabaduitam Ki Jai, Shishi Radha Krishna, Gogopina, Shamakun Radha Kun, Giri Gaurani Ki Jai, Vrindavanam ki jai, Mathuradam ki jai, Mayapodam ki jai, Ganga mai ki jai, Jamuna mai ki jai, Tosi Devi ki jai, Bhakti Devi ki jai, Samaveda Bhakti Vrinda ki jai, O glories to assemble devotees, Hare Krishna, O glories to assemble devotees, Hare Krishna, O glories to assemble devotees, Hare Krishna, O glories to Shri Guru and Shri Guranga, Gora Premanandi, Hare Hare Bo. Oma gina timurandasya gana gana salakaya chaksurun militanyena tajmai shi guru ve namaha shi shetanya manobistam statvitam yena butale swayam rupa karamayam dadati swa parante kam pandeham shi guru shi yuta parakamalan shi gurun vaishnavams cha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatham Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Scha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagapate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanjana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Baneshwari Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakapa Turubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaivacha Patitanan Paven Bio Vaishnabio Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Adwaita Garadara Shivasadi Go Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Maum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shimate Siraswaru Pananda Paramahansa Niti Namine Namo Siraswaru Pananda Paramahansa Namine Gora Karuna Swarupaya Radha Krishna Prastayate Well, speaking on Bhagavad Gita, first I offer my respectful obeisances and the lotus feet of my spiritual master, Jagakuru Siraswaru Pananda Shalaprapa. Who is very dear to Lord Krishna, having taken shelter at his lotus feet. Srila Prabhupada is the mercy manifestation of Lord Chaitanya, Gora Karuna Swarupaya. And very dear to Radha and Krishna, Radha Krishna Prastayate. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord, who are like wish fulfilling trees, able to fulfill all the desires of the fallen living entities, and are full of compassion upon them. Libo Namaste. Thanks for joining me. Um, again, it's just me, Radhi Sham. She has uh, departed for uh, Australia and. Uh, well, she's there in Australia, and uh, with all the travel restrictions, she won't be won't be back for a while. So, um, uh, and also, the, so the program is a bit shorter. We're starting starting the class earlier, and I'll probably speak a little bit less. And uh, and so that's the changes. So, uh, 
and tonight I forgot to plug in the microphone <laughs> to begin with. So anyway, hopefully you could hear it okay. So anyway, so we're in uh, studying Bhagavad Gita chapter 2, and we're up to text 47. And this uh, section of Bhagavad Gita is where Krishna is uh, speaking about Buddhi Yoga. The Buddhi is discernment or intelligence. Uh, so discernment, able to uh, evaluate what is what is good, what's not good. A, a discerning person is someone who uh, knows how they should act and can pick out the um, what's what's really going on. Right? Um, so in uh, previous weeks in the in the um, uh, this section of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has been talking about uh, the Vedic literatures, the Vedas, and how uh, people can be attracted by the flowery word of the Vedas and then flowery words of the Vedas, and then the, particularly the descriptions of the heavenly planets and how one can, uh, by engaging in various uh, Vedic rituals and sacrifices, how one can be elevated to the heavenly planets. Uh, or obtain other types of material opulences. And uh, so Krishna advises Arjuna, you know, that not, not to be bewildered by such things, that people who are bewildered by such things, then they never have the resolution or the determination to engage in devotional service because, of course, they're just interested in material, in their material desires. And uh, so... so Krishna ad advises Arjuna, no, this, this, isn't, this isn't the right way to act. And uh, then he, he describes in uh, text 45 that the Vedas deal mainly with the subject of the three modes of material nature. And he tells Arjuna, become transcendental to these three modes and be free from all dualities and from all anxieties for gain and safety, and be established in the self. And in the verse we studied last week, text uh, 46, he says, All purposes served by a small well can at once be served by a great reservoir of water. Similarly, all the purposes of the Vedas can be served to one who knows the purpose behind them. So Krishna is you know, just describing, essentially describing that the, um, you know, the Vedas, they're not that important. You know, like all the different Vedic rituals and the Vedic sacrifices and everything that's described in there, if you actually know the purpose of the Vedas, the overall purpose of the Vedas, which ultimately is to uh, become a devotee of Krishna, to engage in pure loving service to Krishna, then all these other things in the Vedas just aren't that important. And uh, so then uh, Krishna continues in text 47. And th this is a very uh, nice and important verse in uh, Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna says, Kamanye varikaras te ma falishu kadachana ma kamafala hetu bu ma tisango astra kamani. Kamanye varikaras te ma faleshu karachana ma kamafala hitubu ma tisango astra kamani. You have a right, or arikaras, you have a right to perform your prescribed duty, kaman, kama. But you are not entitled to the fruits of action, faleshu, fruits. Never consider yourself the cause of the results of your activities and never be attached to not doing your duty. You have a right to perform your prescribed duty, but you are not entitled to the fruits of action. Never consider yourself the cause of the results of your activities and never be attached to not doing your duties. So in the, in the uh, previous verse, Arjuna is, oh, sorry, Krishna is almost in a sense uh, basically saying, well, look, there's no need to uh, 
If you know the purposes of the Vedas and the end result of the Vedas to become a devotee of Krishna, then you know you don't really need to follow. You don't need to follow all these other Vedic uh, prescriptions. And uh, you know, so then um, you know, Arjuna could begin to wonder. Well, if that's the case, well then, um, what use is any other actions? You know, what? Why do anyone not just engage in devotional service to Krishna? Why not just engage in, um, you know, worshiping the su worshiping Krishna, worshiping the supreme Lord? And uh, so, Krishna is is initially in the first part of this verse, in uh, Kamani, Kamanye, Kamanye Varikaras Te. He's telling Arjuna, no. Uh, you have the right, and everyone has the right, to engage in their prescribed duties. So Krishna is not, and this is something that Arjuna becomes very sort of confused about throughout chapter 2 and chapter 3, and then he even brings it up again in chapter 5. He's like, Krishna, look, please tell me, are you telling me I should engage in action, or are you telling me that I shouldn't engage in action? <laughs> uh, I can, uh, chapter beginning of chapter 3, uh, which is kind of a, a pickup from this, this verse here. He says, Arjuna says, O oh Janadana, O oh Keshava, why do you want me to engage in this ghastly warfare if you think that buddhi, so buddhi yoga, that intelligence is better than fruitive work? You know, so it's like, well, Krishna, you, you want me to engage in this war, but all along you're telling me that not to engage in fruitive activity. You know, that I, I sh you know, you're telling me that um, uh, the Buddha Yoga is what I should be doing. The Yoga of in discernment or intelligence. My intelligence is bewildered by your equivocal instructions. Please therefore tell me decisively which is the most beneficial for me. Shreyas. And then again, you know, so then Krishna speaks uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4. And then once again in chapter 5, uh, chap text 1, Arjuna says, O Krishna, first of all you ask me to renounce work. And then again, you recommend work with devotion, yoga. Now will you kindly tell me definitively or definitely which of the two is more beneficial. So again, this is the idea of shreyas versus prayas. Prayas is short-term good or short-term beneficial, and shreyas is long-term beneficial. And so when Krishna, or sorry, when Arjuna first uh, surrendered to Krishna or asked Krishna to please uh, instruct him, now I'm sishis te aham sharimam tvam prapanam, now I am a soul, a sishya, now, I am a sishya, a disciple surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. He'd ask Krishna to please tell him what is most beneficial. Yakshreya, sha, nishitan, bruhitan, me. Bruhitan, me. Please tell me what is most auspicious for me. And uh, so here again in chapter 5, text 1, Arjuna is bringing it up again. Will you kindly tell me what definitely which of the two is most beneficial? Either renouncing work so not working, or working uh, with devotion, engaging in uh, karma yoga or buddhi yoga. So uh, Arjuna is confused, and uh, you know. So like, if you're having uh, trouble understanding uh, Bhagavad Gita uh, in chapter two, like what is Krishna actually saying? Well, you you can take some solace in the fact that Arjuna had trouble too. <laughs> so, so um, you know, you, you can take some shelter in the fact that if, um, you know, you're not the only one who, who doesn't quite understand what Krishna is really getting at here initially. And uh, of course we should always understand, as I've mentioned, how Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, when he's 
providing his commentaries and his purports on Bhagavad Gita. He's always taking into account the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita, the, that, uh, you know, we're in 1865 and 1866, where Krishna just makes very clear, look Arjuna, just think about me, become my devotee, offer your homage unto me, um, just worship me. <laughs> and then in uh, that 65, and then in 66, Savadaman Puriti Aja. So abandon all varieties of Dharma or Kama or um, religiosity or feelings of what is right or what is wrong. And Mamikam uh, Saranam Braja. So just surrender unto me one pointedly, Eka, one pointedly. Raja in the mood of the uh, Vrindavan, Raja. Uh, so just abandon all varieties of Dharma and just surrender one pointedly unto me. Aham tvam sava papebi o makshi shyami masuchaha. So um, just don't worry about papa or sinful reaction or any ill consequences just I I will protect you Mokshi Shyami I will protect you from any sinful reaction <laughs> so we, we don't need to be worried about oh is this good karma or bad karma am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing no Krishna is saying I will protect you and then he says Masuchaha don't worry. Do not have any fear. Don't fear, Arjuna. Don't worry. So this this is the uh, conclusion of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and so uh, Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada uh, translated Bhagavad Gita and comments upon Bhagavad Gita and his Bhagavad Gita as it is and his purports. He's always having this end in mind that this is the conclusion. But at this in this early part of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna hasn't made this clear yet. He's describing these, um, you know, this Buddha Yoga, but he hasn't, he hasn't even, at this point, even said that he's God himself. Uh, Krishna doesn't actually uh, say this, uh, uh, even mention this, until text 61 in chapter 2. So, you know, uh, at this point, Krishna's just talking about like the, you know, to, um, you know, he's described what he, what he called as Sankhya, and uh, in text 39 he described it as Sankhya, explaining to Arjuna the distinction between the body and the soul, and that the, the soul does not die. Right? The Deha, the body, dies, but the Dehi, the possessor of the body, doesn't die. He's never born um, and never dies. He's eternal, sanatana, nitya, and uh, does not come into... Anyway, <laughs> I won't go into all the verses in chapter 2 where Krishna explains about uh, the Atma or the soul, or the, the Dehi, the possessor of the body, and that he's eternal and, um, and immutable, inconceivable. Uh, you know, so Krishna's described this and then he started to describe telling Arjuna that he should engage in activity without attachment, that he should engage in, uh, in other words, uh, what's known as nish, nish kama kama yoga, which is um, engaging in action but without attachment to the results. And this is one of the um, definitions or, or aspects of buddhi yoga. So buddhi yoga is working without attachment to results, without being a fruitive worker. So just working because this is what should be done. This is my duty or my dharma. So this is the mood of the nishkama kama yogi, uh, working without attachment to the results, without desire for fruit. And uh, you know, and then Krishna begins to talk about the Vedas, as, as I described earlier at the start of the class, about 
um, you know, wanting wanting to get to the heavenly planets and how this is described in the Vedas and one can follow the certain Vedic rituals and uh, sacrifices and so on and so forth and attain the heavenly planets. And um, so anyway, so after then, of course, then Krishna basically describes that this isn't that important. You know, like if you know the purpose behind the Vedas, then you don't need to go through all these different Vedic rules and regulations. So, but then Krishna is telling Arjuna that you have a right to perform your prescribed duty. You know, so Krishna is not telling people, don't engage in your prescribed duties. This will create chaos in society. <laughs> if, if everyone took Krishna's teachings and just said, oh, Krishna says, I don't need to follow the religious principles. I don't need to follow the Vedas. Then, you know, society would just go to hell in a handbasket. Everyone would just go, oh, well, I'll, I'll just sit around worshipping Krishna. I'll just sit in front of my deities all day and, and worship Krishna. And, uh, you know, I'll neglect my children. I'll neglect my wife. Uh, I'll neglect my uh, responsibilities and my employment. Um, you know, and so on and so forth. I won't serve my parents. I won't take care of my parents. I won't, I'll, you know, I'll just, I won't follow the laws. I'll just do whatever I want. And this will create chaos in society. So Krishna is making clear, no, no, no. No, this is not what I'm saying. Right? You and everyone has the right to perform their prescribed duties. Adhikara. So the right. Uh, so we should perform our duties. But you are not at any time uh, entitled to the fruits of the action or the results. Right? And this is um, and never consider yourself the cause of the results of your activities. So what Krishna is really uh, saying here is that Krishna is ultimately responsible for the results of our activities. We can engage in activities and we can, uh, and if we're motivated to enjoy the fruit, then we'll have the desire to make a certain thing happen. But ultimately, we're not responsible for what happens. We're not the supreme controller. We are not in control. <laughs> Krishna is in control. And Krishna is the one who uh, awards the results of activities through his, uh, you know, not, not personally. <laughs> Krishna is busy playing in Goloka Vrindavan with his cowherd boyfriends and, um, you know, and, and engaging in uh, loving affairs with the uh, gopis and Srimati Radharani. So he's not personally having to go, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'm going to give Mahabhagavad Das the just results of his activities. <laughs> but Krishna, through his um, arrangement, is overseeing uh, through his delegated, uh, through the delegation of his powers to all the demigods, that uh, people get their uh, just results the results of their activities. And so it's not just because we want something that we will get it. You know, there has to be the um, superior power, diva, the, or providence, that awards one the results of one's activities. And so we shouldn't think that just because I'm acting that therefore I will get my result. We have to always be aware that it's subject to the blessing of the Supreme Person, to the to uh, Krishna's sanction, Krishna through his delegated, um, through his delegates, sanctioning that I get the particular results. And so, I mean, just on a very sort of practical level, you can like, you know, you, you can want to, um, <laughs> you know, you can want to go somewhere, but the government can stop you from doing it. Just like right now, there's all these travel restrictions. Actually, my... Um, 
you know, and no, no matter how hard you try, you may not be able to succeed in going. So like, you know, Radhi Sham, she went to Australia. And uh, in Australia right now, they have, the laws are like, well, only certain people are allowed to go to Australia. You have to either be an Australian citizen, um, you know, or you have to be a, a dependent of an Australian citizen. Or you can be a New Zealander if you've been living in, if you've been a permanent resident of Australia. So anyway, so I, I'm the Australian citizen, and Radhi Sham, she's a New Zealander, a Kiwi, and she hasn't been resident in New Zealand. So the only basis on which she can go to Australia is because she's, uh, you know, my dependent, uh, legally speaking. So anyway, so we'd researched all this, right? And then, uh, you know, so she flies off to Los Angeles. And, uh, <laughs> you know, th this has been like something in the works for uh, months, months and months. Been working on this and planning for it and everything. So anyway, so then she finally gets to Los Angeles and, uh, you know, has to change, you know, different airline, has to get to the right terminal. So then she, you know, goes to the right terminal and uh, wants to check in. And so, so we've had all our desires and uh, planning and engaging in activities. And, uh, and then she gets to the check-in and they're like, well, no, we have to call the, uh, have to call the Australian embassy to uh, verify whether you're allowed to get on the plane. <laughs> because, because it was like unusual. Well, okay, what, you're not an Australian citizen. Yeah, okay, your, your husband's an Australian citizen, but where's he? And why isn't he here with you? <laughs> and so they started causing all this, um, you know, asking all these questions and kind of creating this whole kind of scene. And, uh, you know, we're having to, like, uh, email off and scan and email off the marriage certificates and, um, you know, you know, this sort of stuff. It's like, so we're subject to a higher power. Regardless of what our desires are and what we want to see happen, we're subject to a higher power. So um, anyway, in the end, after like a couple of hours, this went on. So Radhi Sharma, of course, is uh, freaking out about it. Anyway, so then in the end, they finally say, OK, you can go. You, you, we'll let you check in, right? Because we knew this all along because it's been very clear she was allowed to go and we checked with the consulate and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, they finally say, yes, you can go. And then American Airlines says, well, it's too late to catch the plane now. <laughs> so, so she didn't get to go. Okay, oh God, what do we do now? Okay, has to rent a hotel room, stay another night in Los Angeles, totally unplanned. So anyway, but the, uh, this is um, the point of this little story is, is like, we're not responsible, right? It, it's the, we're under the sanction of higher powers. For our, to get the results that we want, it needs the sanction of the Supreme Lord through his delegates. Just as to uh, be able to fly to Australia, you need the sanction of the authorities to be able to do it. Right? So anyway, so Krishna is saying, don't think you're the cause of the results of your activities. You're not the cause. You aren't the cause. There's a supreme power over and beyond you that is actually the cause. And don't think that you're entitled to the fruits of your activities. Because right? if, if you are a fruitive worker, in other words, you're doing things because you want to enjoy the fruit, you want to enjoy the result, then this is what binds you to this material world. So last week we were talking about the, the three gunas. You know, um, Krishna told Arjuna that the, you know, the Vedas deal with the subject matters of the three gunas. So the guna is quality, or uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami often used to call it the modes, modes of nature. But these gunas, uh, uh, another word, meaning of the word guna is rope. Right? And so these gunas actually tie us this material world. So we have our different uh, material desires 
And these are like ropes tying us to this world, binding us to this world. It's like the spirit soul, you know, a spiritual and a spirit, a spirit soul, a spiritual in essence. So what is it? What? what? How is it that we're in this material world? Like I'm spiritual. So what? What is this? What do you mean? I'm spiritual. Well, but I'm in this body. So what is it? and and spirit? You know how? You know sometimes we people can get kind of like trying to understand this. How is it that I'm spirit? But I'm within this body, and so it's very subtle. Spirit, of course, is way more subtle than subtle material energy. But it's like our actual our material desires are what bind us to the, our gross, subtle body. And, and through our gross, subtle body, sorry, through our subtle material body, to our gross physical body. Uh, so we have this gross physical body because I have desires. I want to enjoy things in this material world. So therefore, to be able to do that, you know, I like to eat. I like to eat ice cream. Well, I need a tongue with which to eat ice cream. So I have a desire to en enjoy a certain kind of taste. Uh, and so I need a gross physical tongue to do that. And, uh, you know, of course, Srila Prabhupada has spoken uh, so many sort of video lectures when he was lecturing on the process of reincarnation. Where you know he's he's explaining in great detail how the uh, gross physical body is shaped around the subtle material body, and so when we talk about the shape of the subtle material body, we're talking about the shape of your desires, and then this subtle material body is shaped around the soul, and it's like well how is this soul this spiritual energy? That's anti anti material particle, how is it connected to this subtle material body? If the soul is completely spiritual, how is it connected? And so it's you know, it's quite quite amazing, of course, how all this works. But it's because of our desires, it's our false ego, like this ahankara, this identification as being the body, this identification that this subtle material body and gross physical body is me and my desires, it like binds us up like ropes binding us to this material world. And as I mentioned last week, the strongest uh, attachment is the atta you know, the sex desire, this desire to uh, engage in sexual activity leads to marriage and family and so on and it binds us to this world with very fine material ropes. So this desire for fruit, to enjoy the fruit of our activities, this is what binds us to this material world. And so Krishna is telling Arjuna, you know, you're not entitled to the results and you're not the cause of the results. You should work without fruit of desire. Don't be a fruitive worker. Right? You should work with detachment. This is buddhi yoga, the yoga of discernment, or nishkama kama yoga. Working without desire for the fruit or the rewards. And uh, so this is summarized quite nicely in some of the um, commentaries here. Um, In uh, Srila Madhva Acharya, he says, um, Oh well, I'm not finding it. But, but anyway, the point is um, uh, 
Anyway, the point is, is that we, if we engage in fruitive activities, then this will bind us to this material world. So Krishna is advising Arjuna not to do that. So then in the last part of the verse, then uh, Krishna says that one should not be attached to not doing one's duty. You know, so it's like, um, you know, so, so someone could go, as I was saying earlier, one can just kind of go, well, okay, I, I won't. Be. So you're saying don't be attached to the fruits, to the results. Um, okay, well, so I just won't engage in, in uh, activity. I won't perform my duty. I won't uh, fight in this battle of Kurukshetra. You're asking me to fight in this battle, Krishna. You know, but but I, I just I won't do it. <laughs> so, um, you know, and we're all engaged in the our own battle of Kurukshetra. We're all engaged in our own. Um, our own struggles in life where we're having to decide what's the right thing, what should I do, uh, should I do that, should I not do that. And as we're going through our uh, situation in life, we're having to make decisions. And uh, so we can, we can um, uh, decide not to perform my duty. I won't do what I, I won't engage in my uh, duty in my dharma. And so Krishna is telling Arjuna, no, don't be attached to not performing your duty. So he's saying you, you have a right to perform duty, but you don't have the right to the re results, and you, you shouldn't be motivated to perform activities to get the results. And at the same time, you should um, not be attached to not engaging in, in uh, activities. So this is a, you know, a very important verse where Krishna is uh, you know, going into this whole uh, subject matter of karma yoga, the yoga of action, and the mentality with which one should do it. So one should be engaged in action, Krishna is saying. So this is purifying. To work without attachment to the results is purifying and it elevates one to spiritual wisdom. So it's like, you know, karma, for people who are engaged in action, uh, so this kind of like, like there's karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. So for people who are active in this world, uh, they begin with karma yoga. This is like kind of like the lowest rung on the, the yoga ladder. So we're just we're engaging in activities, and so the sort of one of the first steps is to, okay, well engage in these activities, but without attachment to the results. You have a right to perform your actions. Krishna is saying you have a right to perform your actions, uh, but don't be attached to the results. You know, perform these actions out of the, because it's your duty, it's your responsibility, and so you have a right to do that. But don't be attached to the results. And then this, this will purify a person. In fact, in the next uh, verse, Krishna calls that this is, describes this as yoga. This is yoga, working with equanimity or in sameness, in, hap in um, success or failure, happiness or distress. This is, uh, this is called yoga. Uh, is how Krishna describes it. So we'll discuss that. Uh, more next week. And then as one becomes more purified by this process of working in this way, working with detachment, then one can be then become uh, engaged in jnana yoga where one uh, can become an actual renunciate because it's based on actual knowledge. So like if a person is engaged in karma, in action, has a family and whatever, and then just falsely renounces it, becomes a renunciate, even though they still have the desire to act, then it's false renunciation. It's just a disturbance in society, and the person won't be successful at it. They'll fail. And uh, 
you know, just cause a problem for themselves and a problem for society. Uh, but if a person actually becomes elevated in knowledge, then they can take to uh, sannyas or renunciation, the yoga of renunciation or jnana yoga and uh, yoga of knowledge. And, uh, but then as one actually has develops actual knowledge, uh, actual knowledge of course means to understand and appreciate that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and that I am His servant and that my function is to render loving service to Him and then I engage in bhakti yoga. So bhakti yoga includes karma yoga and jnana yoga. Bhakti yoga is uh, its foundation is actual jnana or knowledge of who Krishna is and, uh, and in fact Bhakti Yoga itself is the highest knowledge, it's realized knowledge, it's the fruit of all knowledge, it's Vedanta, the end of all knowledge. Bhakti Vedanta, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Swami's um, uh, title, that he was Bhakti Vedanta, that Bhakti is the end of all knowledge, Anta, N, Veda, knowledge, so Bhakti Vedanta, that Bhakti is the end of all knowledge, so it's actual applied knowledge. And, uh, but it has karma because it involves action. Devotional service, like Bhaktivedanta Swami, when he translated Bhakti Yoga, he just translated it as devotional service. So the uh, service, it, with the implication that it's active. Uh, so we're engaging in activity, practical activities, in, um, in the service of our spiritual master and Krishna. And it's founded on jnana, or knowledge of my true identity. I'm spiritual in essence. And I'm part and parcel of the Supreme Person. I'm not the, I'm, uh, the dominated part and parcel. I'm not the Supreme Person. And that my function is to engage in loving service to Krishna. So this uh, Krishna in teaching here in chapter 2 is teaching uh, Kama Yoga for people who are not yet elevated to the platform of Bhakti Yoga and not even Jnana Yoga. So he's saying you have a right to perform your activities but don't be attached to the results, don't be motivated by the results and don't be attached to not performing your duty. You must perform your duty. You have your um, your you always activities and, uh, and occasional activities, and you must perform them. So this is uh, Krishna's advice to Arjuna. So uh, thank you very much, and we'll just have a short, uh, short chant.
Wednesday is Lord Rama's appearance day and uh, I was going to be giving a, a short talk on the glories of Lord Rama uh, at uh, 6, 6 p.m. Uh, Hawaii time on uh, Wednesday at Congregational Kirtan. Um, there they have, uh, anyway, they have, you probably all know, they have a, all five or six days of chanting <laughs> so anyway maybe you'll join me Haribo thank you Krishna <laughs> 